if you look at the future, uh, the future contains property, art, money, currency, equity, and credit. All those things are going to exist. There'll be thousand, there's currently 100 million companies. As long as there are 100 million companies, there's going to be equity in the companies, whether it's Apple stock or Amazon stock, right? And, and there are always going to be companies because if you look at economics, it's always going to be more efficient for a certain group of people to do something for you than for you to do it yourself. You know, if you, if you roll the clock back to say, you know, 14th century Florence, you know, in the textile industry, they need like 36 different specialists with 36 different machines just to weave a, a piece of cloth. So the good old days of we're just going to do everything ourselves, you know, on a homestead, they never existed. I, you know, I think, I think that, you know, I, I read uh, the other day about finding a axe factory. Don't forget to subscribe crypto traders. Let's continue with the interview and the analysis of this one. A stone axe factory that's more than a million years old. You know, so they find this like Neolithic, you know, uh, Paleolithic, whatever, axe factory. And there's hundreds of axes in the axe factory. And what that's telling you is a million years ago, a bunch of human beings organized a society that was sophisticated enough that they could dedicate one group of, of the society to do nothing other than create stone axes and trade those stone axes for food, clothing, shelter, services, etc. So there's never been a time in human history when people weren't specialized. We're going to have companies. And if you're going to have companies, you're going to have equity. The question is, do we monetize the equity or does the equity trade at its fair value based upon the cash flows that the corporation can generate? And there's and, and credit's not going away. You cannot like bonds, but at the end of the day, you know, you're always going to want to be able to borrow some money from somebody. A company will want to be able to borrow money. Governments will borrow money, and there will be creditors that will want to loan the money. And the real issue is, will it be a fair cost of capital? Will, will I get a fair rate for the money or not? Michael Saylor offers insights into the future trajectories of various facets. Central to their perspective is the enduring nature of equity in companies, asserting that as long as there are 100 million companies in existence, there will always be equity associated with those entities. The efficiency derived from company-based services is emphasized as a driving force in this perpetual equation. Saylor draws attention to the historical underpinning of specialization, a phenomenon ingrained in human societies for millennia. From the bartering of stone axes a million years ago to the present, Societies have consistently organized themselves around specialized roles, underscoring the enduring importance of diverse functions within the fabric of human collaboration. He contends that these essential elements will persist, underlining the perpetual need for borrowing by both companies and governments. The crux lies in managing this borrowing process judiciously to ensure a fair cost of capital. This forward-looking perspective underscores the resilience of financial systems with borrowing identified not as a fleeting necessity, but as an enduring element integral to economic sustainability. You're not going to let eight-year-olds use fire the way that you would let uh, an aeronautical engineer use fire or the way you would let, um, you know, even your campfire instructor, you know, or your survival training instructor use fire. So they're all different. And gold, gold is a monetary protocol formed over thousands of years. You know, and it was used across lots of different, different nations and lots of different cultures. Um, some nations use it better than others, right? The Aztecs, the Incas didn't use gold so much as a monetary protocol. The Spaniards did. They thought they were winning when they used it. They had lots of chaos in, in the way that they used it. There are people that have used the protocol effectively, uh, but there are ways that, uh, you know, the protocol has been twisted. I think... The one, the one takeaway from all of this, though, is, is uh, these protocols are much more powerful to the extent that you, you believe they'll maintain their integrity over long periods of time. And at the point that people start to lose faith in the protocol, if, if, if the number two means four and the number four means eight, think about the chaos. Like, think about how many machines... And how many computer programs break if someone redefines four to be two 
or plus to be minus or, or certain rules, right? And uh, I think um, when Bitcoin is seen as that, as that long-term protocol, we can create economic machines. And, and there's this debate in the community, but most of the community debate is, is Bitcoin developers that actually want to change, uh, that want to cr- change the core protocols. They have ideas for how to make it more functional and more, more, uh, more performant. But really, I think that Bitcoin has already offered us the ability to create a $100 trillion economy without changing any of the protocol. And you have this interesting trade-off, which is the more you screw with the underlying protocol, the more you interfere with the rest of the economy and all of you know layer two, layer three, layer four, layer five. So let me change subjects to one other point, which is I think there's a lot of debate because of people's vision of what Bitcoin should be. For, for example, cryptocurrency has saddled the entire industry with so much baggage because if you believe that Bitcoin is a digital currency, you immediately put yourself in opposition to nation states, banks, political currencies, governments, laws, et cetera, and, and you're by necessity a rebel. Because to be able to use Bitcoin as a currency, you have to actively break laws or topple regimes. And that's a very, uh, a, a very combative view of the world. Cryptocurrency has undeniably made a significant impact on the financial landscape, but its journey has not been without its challenges. One major source of contention revolves around differing perspectives on the fundamental purpose of Bitcoin. This cryptocurrency baggage is largely rooted in the diverse beliefs about what role Bitcoin should play in the broader economy. Some argue that it has already demonstrated considerable economic potential without the need for altering its core protocols. These proponents assert that Bitcoin has provided a robust foundation for various financial applications and transactions. However, this viewpoint isn't universal, as there are ongoing debates among Bitcoin developers regarding the necessity and desirability of changing its core protocols. These discussions reflect different visions for the future of Bitcoin, with some advocating for modifications to enhance its capabilities and address perceived limitations. The tension arises from the contrasting philosophies within the cryptocurrency community. On one side, there is a belief that Bitcoin should evolve to adapt to the changing financial landscape, leveraging technological advancements to improve efficiency and functionality. On the other side, there's a conviction that Bitcoin's existing framework is sufficiently powerful and altering it could compromise its original principles. If you actually conceptualize Bitcoin as property, you know, or money, if if money is collateral that backs the currency, then you actually have a very peaceful resolution to this problem. I'm going to hold um, hold my my money as a store of wealth. And Bitcoin competes with property or gold as a store of wealth, or it competes with stock portfolio as a store of wealth. And I'm going to make that my savings account or my savings portfolio. And then my checking account, my medium of exchange is going to be the currency dictated by the regime where I live, whether it's Venezuela or Argentina or the US or China or whatever. And when you just divide those two and you say Bitcoin is money, but is not currency, Then all of a sudden, you realize that you're competing against other stores of value. And and really, your crusade every day is to convince people to store their wealth in in Bitcoin instead of art, real estate, gold, S&P indexes, bond funds, etc. And you can have a completely uh, neutral view toward tax law, legal tender, political uh, laws, Customs, tariffs, capital controls, price controls, trade controls, wars, ideologies, religions, right? Politicians, right? The, the entire work. So I, I, I definitely think it's so much more constructive to think of it as property than currency. And I think that the twist there is if I take property and I make it fungible and liquid, then it really is money. And it's capital, right? So if you think of Bitcoin as digital capital, digital money, or digital property held for the long term as collateral against uh, against, uh, a local currency, 
And then you say, as a citizen of the world, I'm going to swap into whatever currency I need to spend wherever I am. Then you found a, a peaceful resolution to the question of, do we have, you know, do we have to be martyrs or can we be winners? And I, I've said a lot, I'd rather be a winner than a martyr. And I, instead of saying, we have to use Bitcoin as a currency and therefore you have to repeal all your tax laws and change your legal tender laws, much easier to say, we're going to use it as uh, money or as, uh, as a property and then we will move peacefully and in a compliant fashion through every single regime. And then we're going to convert every company, every government, every politician, every institution into Bitcoin supporters because it's not inconsistent with their worldview either. Everybody would like to store their value forever.